Welcome back. It's still TV3 New Day. And now we're bringing you an interview conducted by um, our very own Alfred. And this was with Emeritus Professor Ivan Adai Mensa. Now, he is an Emeritus Professor in Chemistry and also a former Vice Chancellor of the University of Ghana, Legon. This was between 1996 to 2002. And his story is interesting. Uh, he told us a bit about when he was a young uh, man and how he was able to graduate to class one, and also talked a bit about the president's directive to have some final year students, or all final year students, um, go back to school to complete the exams. And so very interesting conversation. We want you to take a look. This is an all important conversation with a man who has occupied various positions in various levels of national development, in various sectors as well. But most importantly, his contribution to the development of the education sector in this country has been highlighted in various fronts. I'm talking about no, no other than uh, Emeritus Professor Ivan Adaimensa, a former Vice Chancellor of the Premier University, University of Ghana, Lagon, but now enjoying his retirement and not resting because he has a lot of work to do. Prof, I thank you so much for making the time to talk to us. How are you doing? It's, it's been so long. How are you coping in this COVID period? Oh, like anybody else, you just get up, you try and take all, take all the precautions that have been outlined and hope for the best, that you don't catch it, that's all. Well, many people know you for what you have done, your achievements, but beyond what we know, who is Ivan Adaiman, sir? Hmm. Well, my life started almost, eight, well, 10th January 1942. I was born at uh, Akimoda. My father was a schoolmaster at Akim Suedru Methodist School. And my mother was a domestic science teacher. Uh, we were at Akim Suedru when I was born at Akim Da Hospital. From May 1949, when my mother died, we moved to Axim with my father, um, ostensibly for him to go and seek medical help. And uh, for five months, I was out of school with my two other elder brothers. I was the youngest. We were three boys, and I was the youngest. So for five months, I was out of school. So my grandmother, my mother's mother, who was at Takwa, got rather disturbed and came and took my, me and the one that I immediately follow, who is a retired surgeon, a professor of surgery from, of KNUSD now. He came and took us to Takwa. And when I got to Takwa, <laughs> there was no place in the Methodist school for both of us. But in my case, I was admitted to class three without my name being in the register. So I had no desk. I used to sit on the floor and write on a stool. Anytime somebody absented himself or herself from school, then I will perch myself on the persons. You know. After one month, having been out of school for five months, we did the test, and I came forth. So my name was put in the register for Standard 1. The then member of parliament for uh, the Wasa South constituency, which is now Takwan Suhaim constituency, was E.K. Datsun. And E.K. Datsun had stayed with my father to attend school until he finished school. He was brought up by my father. So he took special interest in us when my father died. So because he was a member of parliament, uh, he made me join the CBP Youth League. And together with his own son, our role was anytime Nkrumah visited Tapa or those areas, we would go and onto the platform and recite poems for Nkrumah before he speaks. 
So that's when I started getting myself involved in national <laughs> affairs. I know many people don't know you beyond um, the very elaborate things that you did um, in, in the education sector, having been the vice chancellor of the Premier University, University of Ghana. But I know that you were the youngest um, board chair of the Voter Ever Authority. Want to let us into those other things? I'm on record as the youngest ever chairman of Voter Ever Authority at the age of 37. I started the Petroleum, uh, National Petroleum Authority when we first started that organization to look at the, um, the downstream sector of the Petroleum Authority. In 1972, at the age of 30, I became a member of the Ghana Broadcasting Corporation. In fact, my first paid job was actually in broadcasting in the music department. My boss was Mike Egan. My direct boss was Mike, Mike Egan. I was still then in secondary school. And then when Mills started the Petroleum Commission for the upstream, he also made me the founding chairman. So there are several other things I've done. And oh, of course, in education, I've served on several. And then I've served on various committees of the, the World Health Organization. It's, it's a long story. What do you make of how the virus is playing out on the continent and indeed Ghana? Well, as for the virus, it's, it's here to stay with us. Um, we just have to ab obey the protocols. So far, Africa has been you know, lucky enough not to face the devastation that we are seeing in Europe and America and especially in Brazil. Um, there may be various factors accounting for this. Nobody seems to know. Um, gradually, evidence is beginning to emerge, including this possibility of even vitamin D being a potential immune boosting um, factor. And of course, we in Africa, with the sun shining all the time, our skin is always manufacturing more than enough vitamin D. Who knows? Maybe it's a factor. That's why we have so many asymptomatic pe people running around. But that doesn't mean we should be complacent. Because some people have got it and have developed symptoms. And some have died. Only that it's not as uh, devastating as it has been in other countries. Uh, as a chemistry professor and also uh, being into medicinal chemists, I do know that um, you spent some time at the University of Nairobi between 1985, there about to about 1990, uh, supervising the thesis of some of these PhD students. And, and one of it was on the plant that Madagascar is claiming to have actually used as a herbal base or medicine to the explore the cure of COVID-19. That's the Atemiesia Afra. I know you have done some work on this. Just a brief on this one and whether indeed we should, we should take it serious at all. My feeling is that, you know, I, I have worked on that plant before. I've started, uh, sub supervised two PhDs yeah, of yeah. people yeah, who worked on the plant and other plants. And so I know a lot about it. Uh, it shouldn't be dismissed just like that because there are certain constituents of that plant which scientifically have the potential of uh, helping to manage some of the symptoms, like the congested uh, air passages, like the uh, sudden effects on the cardiovascular system, uh, like some of the fevers that come in, some of the coughs that come in, and even the so-called comorbidity conditions some of them are treated with this plant. So we, we should not just dismiss it offhand. The important thing is for those who are in charge of our health system to make sure that all the necessary tests that need to be done are done. Even with well-known drugs, we, they are constantly being subjected to various tests all the time to make sure that their efficacy is maintained, the consistency is maintained, the, the active ingredients are 
maintained all the time. What do you make of the challenges that COVID has brought to us in the educational sector and how we're going about, you know, easing the first phase of the restrictions and how we are responding to these challenges? We have to find ways out of it. And I think uh, the process has started already. Um, certainly methods of teaching are likely to change. Class sizes will need to be minimized. And uh, that will mean having more teachers in the classroom, more facilities in the classrooms. Um, government should be prepared to put in the necessary financial and other resources to make sure that these uh, facilities are provided uh, for the educational institutions. Um, when it comes to the rural areas, that we, are, we will really have serious challenges. And especially with children in the basic schools. You can separate them in the classroom. You can have distance, you know, social distances or physical distancing, as I would rather prefer to call it, in the classrooms. But what do you do when they go out during recreation? How can you prevent them from interacting with each other, from chasing each other on the football field, from touching each other? You can't go and stand there shouting all the time, don't shake hands, don't touch somebody, don't do this. It's, it's, it's not going to be an easy solution, but I'm sure we can deal with it if we really are serious with it. Yeah. From where you said, what do you want to see to convince you that indeed we're, we're doing this in safety? First of all, let's make sure that whatever facilities are required to make sure that um, the children are safe are provided. Let's make sure that that happens. Talk is easy. Action is difficult. If you say, you know, let's take for example the universities. When I heard what the president said, I, I, I wondered what was going If you say that university classes should be halved, if you take my MPhil final year students, for example, there are only 10. And that, those 10 can be taken at one go. You go to political science department, one class can be as, as many as 1,500. 1, yes, or even 2,000. If you say half of them, you haven't done anything. If you say 100 at a time, it will mean having one lecture given 15 times or 20 times. It's, it's physically and economically and mentally impossible. It will mean tripling, quadrupling your, your teaching staff. Where are you going to get them from? So it's not an easy solution. It's, it's going to take a lot of thinking and a lot of planning. Uh, I'm sure the universities, if they are given the free hand to think these through, will be able to, to overcome the difficulties. Of course, they have to be given the necessary logistics to do so. You were part of the foundation members in the consultation process for the free SHS policy. Uh, prior to the 2012 general elections, President Kofuado consulted you uh, on this policy. What were your opinions then about the policy that's free SHS? I made it very clear that things are not like what, what they were 50 or 60 years ago, when most children could not afford the fee for school. Now we have quite a lot of people who can afford to pay fees at the senior high level. So clearly you agree that in principle the policy is good, but in terms of scope, implementation, and the all-important question of sustainability, have you got answers over the three and a half year period that this policy has been implemented? We don't know how it is faring there, how, how difficult it is for government, especially now that COVID-2 has come to take a lot of the revenue. We don't know what's going to happen. 
ideally, I don't think that it is too late to revisit the issue. But it has now become a political thing. And we are in an election year. If the president says that we are going to revisit the issue, the opposition parties or the minority parties are going to take it. Ah, he has failed. He said he was bringing us furious agents. Now he has seen that the whole thing has failed. It will be a political disaster. On the other hand, if he doesn't go back to it, we may have a price to pay in future economically. And now uh, these children who are now being produced on mass will soon be going to the universities. Where are they going to be put? We haven't even started planning that, that aspect of it and how much it's going to cost. So do you see this happening, that we get to a point where we're not able to sustain this policy? Oh, yes. Yes, I, I, I haven't changed my mind on that. Already the signs are there. And I talk to people, especially some of the teachers and the head teachers, and they, they, they have problems. They have problems. Even with disbursement of funds, the monies don't go early. And now uh, these children who are now being produced on mass will soon be going to the universities. Where are they going to be put? We haven't even started planning that, that aspect of it and how much it's going to cost. And university or tertiary education is not cheap. Had it not been for COVID-19, the first badge of the free SHS students should have been preparing to go to the university in September. Exactly, exactly. But nothing much has been added to any infrastructure in any of the universities. A few universities had some structures under construction, dating back even to the previous government. They are still not complete. The geology building in Legon, uh, which is a, a Ghana Education Trust Fund project, is still, is still under construction. Several other projects all over the country are still under construction. And now we are going to turn our attention to constructing health facilities. You know, it's not going to be easy. And I, I don't envy the government. Do you see government listening to divergent views now about, for example, that some of the things that you raised or the questions that concerns that you raised about the policy prior to its implementation? Well, I can't speak for government. It's up to them to listen or not to listen. The problem in this country is that when people speak normally, people make up their minds before they, they start any issues. So when you start asking questions or raising issues, their minds are made up. And they think that it's a sign of defeat if they listen to you and um, uh, try and, or even accept to go back on the original idea. A typical example is what is happening with a new university bill that is being discussed, you know. Um, I cannot speak for government. Those of us who make our views known without fear or favor, uh, we will continue making it, but many of us are getting more and more frustrated, especially those of us who are nearing the twilight of our lives. You know, uh, I've been in this thing since, since I was nine, nine years old. You will be surprised. Uh, and I'm still, I'm still in it. If you know my life history, you will know that uh, I've been in national affairs or national service since I was just nine years old. Um, I may get to a point when I'll say I'm tired. Let others take it up. Well, you, you made reference to the public universities bail, um, which is in parliament now, and the almost over 38 
CSOs, institutions that have raised concerns about the various aspects of this particular bill. How does this bill threaten the autonomy of public universities? In many ways, I, I wouldn't like this program to focus on that because I will need a whole program. Other bodies are taking care of it. The Academy of Arts and Science has presented its memo. Uh, they were in parliament yesterday. UTAG, also okay, CDD, all, I understand there are about 38 or 40 different uh, um, memoranda before parliament. So they will deal with it. But first of all, it is unconstitutional. Yes. So some aspects of it are unconstitutional. The ministry is claiming that there is a national tertiary education policy out of which the bill emerged. But some of us know a few things about that national policy education and how it emanated. And uh, it, it, it belies what the minister is saying. And that policy document itself has a lot of problems with it. Some aspects of it are unconstitutional. The foundation policy. That yes, uh, out of which they claim. But I happen to know, uh, and anybody can challenge me, that whilst that policy document was still in preparation, a draft bill was already uh, circulating in various circles. I know that. And anybody who thinks that I'm not, I, I'm not telling the truth can come and challenge me. You know. So you ask how it affects autonomy. The 1992 Constitution had a certain aspect which wanted the universities to be autonomous and independent, both in the spirit and the letter. If you take Article 68.1, it seeks to say that no president of the country, while in office, can hold any office in any university, not just the public universities, any university in the country, which means that the spirit of it, the framers of the constitution, did not want any president to have anything to do with any university as far as holding office is concerned. Because before that 1992 constitution, the head of state was the chancellor. And then Article 195, which outlines the way certain officers of the state are appointed. 1953 specifically takes out the higher education institutions and research institutions and says that appointment of officers of these institutions should be by the governing councils. So now, if you have a bill which seeks to have the president appoint the chancellor of the university and the chairman of the university council, who are both principal officers of the university, then you are definitely going against both the letter and the spirit of the constitution. Emeritus Professor Ivan Adaimensa, I want to thank you so much for making your time, sit with us, talk to us, let us into your life and into your home and then also make suggestions for the good, for the greater good of this nation. Thank you so much and I wish you well. It's a pleasure.